gleaming vehicle sits poised and peaceful out there, that there is time, if only briefly in this busy morning, to think of those three men and the burdens and the hopes that they carry on behalf of all mankind. From the backwoods of Florida to the frontier of space, these pioneers push the boundaries of science. Most of our cell phones today have more computing power than we had when we landed on the moon. With an idea that changed the course of history. If the goal is worth the risk, stop worrying and just go do it. Bob Seek was one of America's first engineers to design, test, and launch ships into space. And they did it to win a conflict on Earth. We're at war. It's a silent war, war type thing, but we're at war here, and uh, we're going to win it. This war started after World War II. So comrades, Stalin took a leap from Hitler's book. Nazi control of Eastern Europe gave way to communist domination under Stalin's Soviet Union. They envisioned the entire world Sovietized and united communist style by attempting to convince the great and growing mass of uncommitted nations that communism is a way of life superior to all others. The United States had a new Cold War enemy. It created a battle of wits between two superpowers. They tried to win over other nations by showing their way was more advanced. What inspired people to keep with it is we got to beat the Russians. That kicked off the space race, which captivated viewers around the world. TV, television has just kicked in. The Soviets jumped out to an early lead, launching the first satellite into space and making Americans nervous. I guess the American people alarmed that a foreign country, especially an enemy country, can do this and it, we fear this. The U.S. military played catch up by finding a new place to work. Cape Canaveral, Florida was the perfect spot. We needed a place where we could launch a vehicle over the ocean and not endanger the community. So this was an ideal place. And closer to the equator than most of the nation, which improves rocket flight. Here in 1958, a newly created agency called NASA developed the Mercury program to send men into orbit. Uh, lift off and the clock is started. Then President John Kennedy came up with an idea that changed the game. He set a single goal with a deadline many thought impossible. To achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. They would need a new, much larger spaceport near Cape Canaveral that we would later call Kennedy Space Center. Here, engineers like Ken Boinbuff designed and built the Saturn V moon rocket, the largest ever built. And I still have vivid memories of walking on the side of one of those vehicles looking up and thinking, my goodness, I mean, how fantastic is that? Charles Murphy helped build the Saturn V's midsection. Well, my career started in, in weaponry. He was a weapons expert who had been testing nuclear bombs. The power that that unleashes, it was frightening. <laughs> he went from destroying to creating. The challenge of going to the moon was just overwhelming. It inspired engineers who were driven by nature. A lot of us had spent time in the military. We were mostly guys. Mostly guys, with one exception in the firing room. Joanne Morgan was Kennedy Space Center's first woman engineer. I always thought I would get married, have four to six children, and I'd be a piano teacher. <laughs> Until her senior year of high school, when America launched satellites and hooked her on space. It was the new knowledge, that was, that was what grabbed me. And I thought, maybe I want to be an engineer. She embodied NASA's can-do spirit before she even applied. And I thought, surely they'll give me a chance to do this, and they did. But being a trailblazer did have its challenges. There's no ladies restroom. Right off the bat, the test supervisor told me, oh, we don't have women working here. Or I called my boss. My boss said, sit down, plug in your headset, go to work. They finally just got used to me. They adjusted, and they came together like family. The camaraderie that people had for one another, the people just kind of fell in love with one another, probably because we had a single goal. And they craved the freedom to improvise. Hey, if it didn't work, don't do a drawing. Go to the grinder, grind the damn thing off, stick it back in if it works. Okay, well, we'll go with this. This is what we're going to do. Milt Heflin was an Apollo recovery engineer, meaning he got it out of the ocean when it splashed back to Earth. I had a lot of freedom to just go do stuff, and and that was huge. Godspeed, John Glenn. Zero G, and I feel fine. After Mercury sent John Glenn into orbit, NASA took the next steps with the Gemini missions. These two seat capsules taught the astronauts how to work in space. In a first near disaster, Gemini 8 malfunctioned and started spinning out of control until its commander Neil Armstrong saved it. 
NASA then transitioned to the three-seat Apollo capsules designed for reaching the moon. But Apollo 1 caught fire during a mock countdown. It killed astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. I can hardly even think about them without, without tearing up uh, because they're old comrades. It's probably something I will never get over. And, and that's what drives us to perfection. We don't ever want that to happen again. It set NASA back more than a year as they redesigned the capsule. So NASA took an unplanned leap. I mean, everybody was in a, let's go, let's go get it done. Instead of a planned test flight around Earth, Apollo 8 took off to orbit the moon. It was the gutsiest thing that this team has ever done in human spaceflight. Then Apollo 9 and 10 led to the historic flight of Apollo 11. NASA chose Gemini 8 hero Neil Armstrong to command, Buzz Aldrin to pilot the lunar lander, and Michael Collins to pilot the command capsule. Zero, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. The whole room shook my consoles and I put my elbows on my chair at one point and I could feel the vibration through my bones. After four anxious days, Apollo 11 reached the moon's orbit. Let's hang tight and look for landing radar. On July 20th, 1969, Armstrong and Aldrin took the lander called the Eagle down a new frontier called the Sea of Tranquility. Bravo two. But its computer malfunctioned and steered them toward the side of a crater. And so there was a lot of tension. <laughs> the firing rooms and the control rooms in Houston were quiet. 60 seconds. As he did on Gemini 8, Armstrong took manual control and saved it, landing with 17 seconds of fuel to spare. When we finally heard the words, Houston, the Eagle has landed. The Eagle has landed. The firing room and the control room was just erupted. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again, thanks a lot. Armstrong was such a skilled pilot, he led in more gently than the engineers planned, so the retractable legs of the Eagle didn't fully compress. That even collapsed too far. And that made for a bigger leap than they intended. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This is the moment the U.S. beat the Soviets and mesmerized nations around the world. The first time I can think of that people all around the world, we were all doing the same thing. We were all locked on to watching these men as they landed on the moon and as Neil Armstrong stepped out. What was it like watching a man on the moon? What was going through your head and heart? It was, it was just uh, you know, careful. Sometimes I still get choked up about it a little bit. For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. It helped the United States win the Cold War. They look at Kennedy as a can-do center. No matter what the problem is, we figure out a way to make it happen. The Soviet Union sputtered and dissolved 22 years later. The race to the moon also fueled revolutions in electronics, computers, high-speed communications, and medicine. The people at the time that made these decisions knew that the technology that it would foster. It also transformed Central Florida from marshes and orange groves. When people asked me where I was from, if I said Orlando, they'd never heard of it. Into a hub of labs and electronics factories with a mass migration of young families taking high paying jobs and the flood of space tourists, it drove pent up demand for family entertainment, which Walt Disney tapped into and built the theme park capital of the world. I thought we'd died and gone to heaven. There's no way in the world I was gonna ever leave this place. And now their work is inspiring the next giant leap. And lift off of Artemis One. Embarking on a brand new program that has much, much more potential than we had during Apollo. The discovery of ice beneath the lunar surface is driving NASA back to the moon, this time to build a permanent colony. That ice can be mined and electrolyzed by solar power to make water to drink, air to breathe, and rocket fuel for manned missions from the moon to Mars and far beyond. If we have only just begun to discover what we don't know yet. We don't even know what we don't know. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win.